Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the Relearn session. Just a note that the Q&A will be open during the presentation and you can post your questions using the red button at the bottom right of your screen. With us today, we have Dr. Pua Chitek, Director NACE, National Centre of Excellence for Workplace Learning, Nanyang Poly. NACE plays a major role in helping SMEs in the journey to implement workplace learning to retain and build competencies. NACE has helped SMEs from various sectors such as healthcare, engineering, service, retail, logistics and hospitality. Dr. Pua's topic for today will be learning at workplaces to retain and build competencies. Dr. Pua, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, okay, good. I'm waiting for this. Okay, learning at workplace to retain and build competencies, that's what we are doing here today. Um, before I start, let me quickly introduce to you who is NACE. So um, NACE was actually set up in, uh, it's a strategic partnership by SkillsFuture Singapore and Nanyang Poly to help enterprise retain and build competencies through workplace learning. And this actually is only possible because we have partnerships with the Swiss and the CIVET, uh, CIVET basically the Swiss, and then the IHK from Germans, together with the Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce, SGC. NACE also came up with the National Workplace Learning Framework and is now adopted by SSG as the framework for Singapore's workplace learning. This workplace learning framework consists of six components as you can see here, we have the strategy. So strategy is really about how companies want to reach their business goals, the corporate goals, through ways of developing competencies. And we have leadership. The leadership is really about helping or coming up with a communication plan that the leaders from the top all the way down to the line supervisors are able to recognize learning at workplace as a key element for developing competencies. Without proper planning, things won't happen. So planning becomes a very important element or components in this framework to allow systematic and purposeful learning to happen at workplace. Training in analysis frames the learning and development of the individuals and the company's competencies so that the competency bank can grow. And the last two most important components are the environment and the processes because environment sets the stage for everybody to do it together and recognize it in the company and the processes allow them to do it as part of the workflow. So this is the National Workplace Learning Framework and it's adopted from Germany. So NACE helps company through training them to understand what is workplace learning, to consultancy service to show them how to do workplace learning at the, at the workplace Experiential learning allows us to bring companies to companies to countries like Germany and Switzerland to see how is it being implemented there and learn from the best in class. And last but not least, events and outreach where we talk and share our experience with companies and hopefully they can come and join us in this journey to help them build and retain competencies. So before I start the session for today, um, let me quickly ask you, are you in the right session? So if you're not in the right session, I guess it's time to lock out. But if you're in the right session, um, I'm going to talk about quite a number of things, but in a nutshell, the blue ones, as you may see on the screen, is really, what can I do as an employer, as a company? And the red one is, what is my role as an employee in this new norm where COVID-19 has happened and is still happening. So that is the impact of COVID-19. And that's what we're going to talk about quickly. Four key points. I'll run through them. And meanwhile, please feel free to ask questions along the way. I'll take them at the end of it. So the impact of COVID-19 cannot be denied, be it globally or locally. It has happened. And for the last six months, every one of us has gone through quite a big change in our life. 
But what happened to things that were already there and suddenly changed very fast? So one example is digital transformation. COVID-19 brings us home to work from home. And the other thing that really happens is actually many Singapore firms speed up their digital push. Digital transformation is a very old word, it's a cliche. But in the last six months, became the most important thing that everybody has to do to remain viable in terms of business. What is really different is, are we there? The skills gap to support and make this digital transformation possible has been known way before COVID in December 2019, that there are gaps that we need to make. But today we are running so fast. How many of you feel that you can really cope with it? And how many companies are really doing a lot more and the employees are trying very hard to catch up with it? So that's really about the impact. Another thing that's happening and has been happening for a long time is job redesign. As you mentioned just now, working from home has changed the landscape. How do we change our job today? Is what we are doing yesterday still valid? So that's really about job redesign. And together with that, can we do learning at workplace to expand our current job role and make learning everywhere and part of the work process? So before I go on to talk more about workplace learning and all this uh, impact of COVID-19, I want to really unpack relearn these sessions that we're going to talk about now. This recession, actually, we talk about relearn. Relearn is a very simple word because you have learned in front, you have learned relearn at the back. But what's the thing about learn? We learn when we are you know, students, we learn when we're at the workplace, and we are now asked to relearn. What is the most important component in the relearn part is the attitude and mindset. Are the employees ready? Are the employers also ready to support this? And when everybody is there, the unlearn process must happen. For example, in the past, we used to go to a shop. We buy anything. The first thing we do is we take cash from our, our wallet to pay. Today, if you go to a shop, you are advised or encouraged to go cashless. You pay online most of the time. So what is the thing that we are unlearning now? Maybe the simple thing that every day I have to unlearn is to stop taking my wallet out to pay and then try to use my phone to pay so that I don't need to touch anything. So the unlearn process is not easy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of support, be it peer and company support, to make it happen. So before I go on, um, this unlearned process is very important, and that's why I want to have a quick check with everybody. If you may just help me. Uh, I'll show these results later at the end of the session. Please go to Mentimeter or menti.com. Um, you can scan the QR code, you can key the code, or you can use a, uh, the hyperlink in the, in the, in the screen now. Um, tell me, what are the challenges you face to relearn? The challenges can involve many things. It can be yourself, it can be your peers, it can even be your home. Because working from home today has itself a challenge. So you just take a pause here for about 30 seconds and let everybody try to Lock in and see whether there's anything that uh, you want to share. Please try it because I have not seen any key in yet. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Uh, seeing some, some people trying it, so please try it because um, only if we share, then as we move on, I'll conclude with this word cloud on what we are today, uh, where we are today, and how do we move forward from here. Thank you very much. I can see more people keying in now. Awesome.
great. So as you, you can continue to key in the, your, 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 your response to that because um, I have so much time, so let me quickly move on. Drive towards workplace learning, that's the next topic I'm talking about. So what is workplace learning to me or to you? Um, there are a lot of definitions, but I'll take the simplest one here. Okay? It's really about acquiring knowledge, skills, competencies, formally or informally at the workplace. As simple as that. So what is this formal, intentional, plan, aware part you call it? So generally, we call it structured. Structured means that there is a way that you do it, there is a repeatability, and you can get multi people, different people to do the same learning consistently. Informal is unstructured. You have a coffee with your, with your colleagues and you talk about the work, and wow, you actually discover that, hey, my, 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 the guy sitting next to me was doing a good job, but we're doing the same job. So can we learn from each other to do a better job? So there's peer sharing. Group discussions is sometimes your company organize a group discussion, sharing. You can also do that, it's unstructured. So in many literature, um, the unstructured is major component of many of the learning. But here I put it almost the same, but it's not whether they're the same or different. It's really about whether, is there a way that your company recognize that you're learning and you yourself recognize your learning? Because if you don't recognize that you're learning, you will not take the knowledge, plug it into your head, and make it your knowledge. You will be still, yeah, I just do it this way, law. so what's the big deal? No big deal. So we're talking about strategy, we're talking about leadership, we're talking about environment, and recognition and support. And some of these words I have covered earlier, the framework for workplace learning, is really about the company, and you embracing learning yourself and companies supporting you through a way, a systematic way, and drives the learning in the company as a culture. And that's what people talk about. Learning happens mostly in that workplace, and that's not why I say, but it has been known for many years. 10, 20, 70 rule. If you look at the 10, 20, 70 rule, if you add 20 and 70 together, that's 90. And that's the power of workplace learning. On the job experience, coaching and mentoring are really happening every day. If you know how to do it, if you acknowledge it, you will do well. And classroom learning must still happen because sometimes you just need to get away from work, sit somewhere with a friend, with your colleagues, learn something together and enjoy it. So that's why we talk about in workplace learning and not only I say that, we must, we must actually have some data to su support it. So if you look at um, this survey that was done by SAP, um, we look at three categories or six categories of people that uh, look at workplace learning or on-the-job training. Compliance training, people that must comply on regulatory work safety. Onboarding, if you look, OJT, on-the-job training, on-the-job coaching are high, highest in the trend. Customer service sales, again, is scored the highest. And last one but not least, leadership development and technical, which a lot of people say oh, leadership cannot have on-the-job training. It's not true, actually. Most of leadership happens on the job. If ever you're a leadership position and you change your job, do you expect to attend a course to, be how, to, to, be how, to know how to be a good leader? You start the job, you learn on the job, and you ask the one who is next door and says, hey, can you guide me a bit, can you help me a bit? And I learn on the job. So, in a nutshell, learners rank training methods differently across topics, but on the job training, which is part of the structured component of workplace learning, is considered effective regardless of the topic. So, workplace learning and skills gap. So that's why I'm talking about skills gap when we talk about the, the digital transformation happening. So there's actually no skills gap definition that I can find on the net. They are just really talking about consensus, okay? Where you talk about performance caused by lack of skills at work. And um, we have actually quite an interesting article you can see on the website here to talk about how to close a skill gap. 
Many a times we thought, oh, closing skill gap is going to just attend a course. But remember the 70, 20, 10 rule? If you go on that kind of thinking, you can't close the gap. It is really about learning on the job and really about making learning a culture in your workplace to let skills gap be closed. To give, show you some statistics again, importance of skills gap as by LinkedIn reports in 2020 and 2019. From the left hand side 2019, it is more for talent development. So number one, identify and assess skills gap is the number one things to do for talent development. In 2020, the thing changed a bit. From a learner's perspective, what is the most important thing that I must, or the organizations must help me to stay in the company? It's really about career goals and skills gap. What are my career goals? And what are the skills that I need to develop to meet my career goals? So the data are here, and it's evident. But having said so much, how do I start? Usually, I come from these two perspectives. Remember, I started off with saying employer perspective or company perspective. Then we talk about employee perspective. In employer perspective, we are looking at assisting performance of my company, assisting challenges. So before COVID-19, they were talking about performance challenges. When COVID-19 happens, the performance and challenges also change quite a bit. Same thing for employee, assisting performance and assisting competencies. Are you ready as an employer to face the market, be it growth or even just to survive? Your performance is important. And the challenges today, due to COVID, due to the situation of the economy, there are a lot of impact. So what are your current challenges and how do you face them? And how do you face the future challenges? And from an employee perspective, it is very important because a company only works when the employees are together with you. And that's where we talk about, should the employees start looking differently in terms of their goals? What kind of expectation am I? Today, I'm looking from home. Tomorrow, I'm going back to office. Can I do it? How do I do it? And tomorrow, the whole world is in the digital transformation. How would I then look at my skills and benchmark it based on the industry needs? So with that as a background, I thought it's a good time to do a check. A check on whether, do you think your company has workplace learning? After I said so much. And are they helping you to close the skills gap that you are experiencing today through workplace learning or have a system to help you? So I need your help again. Please scan the QR code. I think the screen is hang. Yes, we need to go to the next slide, but it's hang. So if you go back to just now that Menti, if you're still at the same screen in the Menti, um, go back to the browser earlier, okay? Yes, please, it's here. Okay. There's only one question here for you to answer. My company has structured workplace learning. Do you strongly agree or strongly disagree? So again, I, I really hope that you all can give me the inputs because it gives a lot of sense to how the Singapore landscape is happening. And to you, I hope, be it a company or as an employee, you will see that if you understand or agree with workplace learning as a way to go, would you want workplace learning to be the way to go for you? I'll give about 30 seconds here. You can look at it, think about it. If you are very strongly against it, strongly agree or strongly disagree, please feel free to, to, to put your comments in that, put your scale. Because after this, I will show you really about where to start, how to go, and how some company has done it as examples. So as you continue to give you the answers, let me go on to the next slide and tell you where are we and how does Singapore helps in turn understanding or helping both yourself and the company or your employer to understand where are we today in terms of the competencies. So for employer perspective, we talk about skills required for business growth and transformation. 
And business opportunity in the different growth sectors, as you can see on the newspaper cut that we have extracted here, everybody is looking at changing the focus of the business. And from an employee perspective, the skills framework actually provides you with a way to know that, hey, I, where, where are my skills today I'm doing? What should I do tomorrow? What should I learn? And this is really evident from the newspaper we have seen here. But most importantly, when you look at the top where the arrow points to, the benchmark, my skills to industrial expectation and looking at adjacent sectors okay, or adjacent roles so that I can develop transferable skills. So with that as a background, let me quickly share with you three examples. The first example is a company that wants to do digital transformation. It came to us and asked us, hey, how do, why do I start with digital transformation? Are my guys having the right skills? So we actually look at it and says, okay, let's look at the overview of a OJC on the job blueprint for a service engineer. So from, a, from the point where there is an order service received from customers, to buying the parts, testing it, and installing it as and the, at the customer side, and then finally billing. What we saw was the fact that there are a lot of potential nodes for digitalization to happen. And that was what's helping the company with. And with this potential, the employee also needs to know what do I need to do? What do I need to be trained in? And how do I go about doing my work differently in a job redesign manner and what are the software and hardware required and expected to support this workflow. The next example is really about the job redesign. Um, the next example is actually about job redesign where we talk about how to develop job roles to provide better customers experience through workplace learning. It's really about bridging the gap on the job. So here again, um, we have a very nice experience or, or, or article together with Novotel. Um, the link is there. It's on the pub, in, the, in the public domain. So it's really about understanding customer's journey, experience journey based on the guest experience. And the company together with our team in Nanyang Poly, we look at the ideation and enhanced guest experience to achieve what we call an outcome of merging or getting the job role more expanded for everybody. The third important case which I thought is important for, for useful for all of us to share here is structured workplace learning. So what is structured workplace learning? There's a learner you can see, there's a blueprint which is basically the, the way to learn, there's a mentor and a coach. The coach actually helps to provide the skills demonstration and the mentor helps the person to know what the company has in mind for him and what is his career plan. So with Gardenia, the company that we work with also through our work study program, we've developed OJT blueprint, codified the key tasks and after about six months of working with them and they tried the OJT blueprint, they discovered something very interesting. First thing is, I don't need to send my, send my stuff every time for training. My guys who are very experienced at the workplace can help me. And most important of all, it has shortened the lead time by about 30% to help staff to work independently. So in a nutshell, to sustain workplace learning, we need to have competent people, competent mentors, coaches, and of course, subject matter experts. Otherwise, who is going to do the training? Committed management, it must be a way to understand workplace learning and its benefits and really advocate it to allocate appropriate resources to support it. And last but not least, is a robust system to check and monitor the effectiveness of workplace learning. So key takeaways. So as with usual lectures, um, we actually very important to recap um, what we actually started off with. Remember we start off this, we're talking about how employers can do or what employers can do and some local examples in the blue text. The next thing I'm going to talk about is what employees can do and I've actually done that by sharing with you 
how the employees can look at what I'm doing today, benchmark it to the industry expectations and the potential for me to work and understand and grow myself towards a new me. So that as a backdrop, I'll conclude today's key takeaways for employers. It's time for you to review your business model. Is this what you're doing today the best for your company? Is this what you're doing today the best for the situation to remain competitive? It's time also to stop take your company's bank of competencies. Digital transformation is running faster than ever. Is your bank of, your competencies bank ready, able to support it as a company? And are there gaps that could potentially jeopardize your digital transformation journey as a company? And last but not least, as an employer, plan for your staff to learn at workplace, to look at how the job can be better designed. And when the employee actually do the work, good work of learning on the job and doing the transformation together with you, please recognize their commitments because those are very important elements for it to happen because our employee now, which I'm going to show or I've just shown, is to really talk about me. I'm an employee, so what does, what, what does it mean? If my company, if my employer needs to remain competitive, what do I need to do? I must have the right attitude and mindset. Remember we talked about the unlearned part? Many things I need to unlearn so that I can follow the transformation journey. I'm right mindset. I must support it. Company needs to transform because the world has changed. COVID has made an impact. I didn't find my own skills gap. And most important of all, for people who are more senior, why don't you develop some coaching skills to help your junior staff learn better at workplace and get them up to speed. And for junior staff, I think it is about time to develop competencies and provide peer support. You need to talk to your peers. And that allows me to conclude for today. And I thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm Chitek here from the National Center of Excellence for Workplace Learning. You can see my email there. If you want to find out more about NICE, you can scan the QR code. Otherwise, I'll just stop here and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poa. We will now proceed to the Q&A session. Dr. Poa will first address the findings of the Mentimeters just now, followed by the questions we have posted. Okay. Wow. I can see people are still kicking in. Okay, so very good. This is something that's important, right? What do you see? Time. The biggest word that everybody has or don't have is time. So time and no time is the same uh, to me. Time, no time, lack of time, it seems to be the, 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 the big words there that you can see. So where is the time we are talking about? If learning or relearn is part of your job, how would you make workplace learning useful? so that the time is happening at the workplace. At the same time, you are also learning. I can see another word that is called fear. Fear is quite a big word. Okay? Fear is really about whether are you ready to face it because time has changed. Go to the next one. Okay, great. Okay, great. So I can see about half of your thing that, or, or most of your thing that you're neutral because your company may or may not have structured workplace learning. So what is really the part that caused us, or most of us to think this way? And why am I talking today about workplace learning so much? It's because it is true that most companies don't have a structured way to train people, and we know it. So we are trying very hard, and that's the purpose of why NACE is around. NACE is set up because we are here to help companies implement workplace learning, to come up with systems and to help them. And these are important elements that we need to work together. So please, if your employer just not a QR code for NACE, scan it. I'll show it later again. Otherwise, 
For employee, please also come and contact us. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poa. Uh, here's a question from Alex of ITE. Staff are concerned over work from home, how this will affect their work performance. How do we qualify the work from home performance? Working from home is a new norm. It's also a future norm. We're talking about COVID-19 today. We're talking about some other disease tomorrow. The question here is, is your job or have you looked at your job role and redefined the job role based on what you can do at home? That's something that I think we have to be very clear about. If you have done that together with your supervisor, the next question here is, is your organization and your supervisors open to look at a way to look at your job, redesign your job, and to remeasure or to recalibrate the yardstick that we used to have in terms of um, working from home and working from office. If that is something that you are ready and you have spoken together with your supervisors, I guess that shouldn't be a fear about whether work from home will have a challenge or impact on your performance. If you have not done that, it's time to do that because without a very sincere speech or discussion with your supervisors and organization, things will always be unclear. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poa. The next question is, 70% of time is spent on workplace learning, 20% on coaching and mentoring, 90% spent on training at workplace in total. So what tangible support can be given to employers for doing this? Would funding be an answer? <laughs> Very good question. Yes, a lot of people talk about funding, but you see, when, when we talk about funding for employers, it's really about the extrinsic push. But what's the intrinsic needs? Why, why do you embark on this journey in the first place? Is it because you wanted the money? Or is it because you sincerely want to retain and build competencies for your organization? There's two parts of the, the, the thing. If you, the intrinsic need has to come from the fact that if your companies need to do better tomorrow, is it better to send your clerks for course or your staff for courses and get some funding for that? Or is it better for the person to work at the same time, learn at the workplace while contributing as part of the work and become more effective in delivering the outcomes that your company needs? So I guess we always have to go back to the needs of starting this journey. The need is not really just about funding. It's about recognizing your staff Recognizing the need for your staff to learn and the best place to learn is at your workplace and the best people to teach them are the experts who are already at the workplace. Don't forget, there's always new technology coming. So the 10% of the classroom will come in for your guys to know what are the, evo uh, the, the changes in the industry landscape, the technology and the best practices and bring it back to the company and expand it. So in a nutshell, funding is good, but the fundamental of the company need to survive, to build and retain competencies will be the most important elements. Thank you. Dr. Poa, the next question, mentoring and coaching skills can be lacking in some supervisors, ROs and bosses. How do we level up and develop the culture of mentoring, coaching? There are many ways to develop a culture. Culture actually cannot happen overnight. Um, to, for culture to first of all start, the companies need to acknowledge, the people need to acknowledge there's a need. Again, the need is important because it's intrinsic. Second of all, are the supervisors empowered with the skill? So I, 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 we have actually encountered quite a number of, engaged quite a number of companies. Um, the biggest challenge is really not that they don't want to, the supervisor don't want to do it. They just don't know how to do it. I guess that is the, the, the common thing that everybody thinks. Hey, if I throw you a new guy, coach him tomorrow. So the first thing that you, you will scratch your head and say, yeah, how? Ah? Where do I start? 
Where's the endpoint? Oh, very tough. So that's where I think it is very important for companies to recognize that there is a need. It is very important to really empower them. Um, if you go to NACE website, we do conduct mentoring and coaching courses. They're just two days. A very short two days course will empower your supervisors to help many of your people. And that is very important because if you don't go into that mode and start a journey by empowering them, you can't get satisfied people working on a job. So many young people actually go to the job and say, wow, well, I come to a job, there's no structure learning, every day is fighting fire, and tomorrow I, I quit. Oh. But this situation is very tough, like a lot of people don't want to quit. But the fact is, if you don't have a nurturing culture, a nurturing supervisors who can coach and somebody who can help to mentor the person in his career growth and bridge the skills gap, there is a huge loss of talents in your company. So that's where I would su suggest to start, empower your people, work with them to understand the need and part of company transformation has to include this element of learning in the workplace and get empowering your people to learn at the workplace with the right supervisors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pua. The next question is, how can we develop a culture of peer collaboration in the workplace? Mm. Peer collaboration actually is a very big topic. I mean, um, we are always collaborating with our peers most of the time. It's just that whether do we recognize that we are collaborating with our peers. I think many at times we, we, we go into this mode where, yes, we know, I can share with my peers. But after I share, do I lose that advantage? So the culture itself has to be promoted from the people, from the management, from the supervisors. If we really want to make a culture of peer sharing happen, it has to start from top down and bottom up. And that also means that yourself is starting from myself. If I were to do it the other way, um, will it be better? Can I talk to somebody? Or how are the, my peers doing the same thing that I'm doing? Take for example, if you're going to, you're doing digital transformation and everybody is doing digital transformation within the company, okay? Is somebody, and my, but your colleague seems to be quite happy and, and, and relaxed, but you're very stressed or a lot of things to do. What could be the difference? So that could be also something that is useful to promote platforms for people to share. The company must have platforms for sharing. Um, nowadays, I cannot say go and have a coffee because uh, COVID-19 is around. But your department head or your group discussion could have done it through uh, e-learning or e-meeting mode. So have more sessions of e-learning or e-meetings to discuss things, um, not to really uh, go into work all the time. You can chit-chat, but chit-chat always it's important, but it's useful also to start a conversation and brings back the needs for some learning along the way. Okay, thank you. Hey, Dr. Pua, we have time for one more question. How can we better recognize the time and effort taken by employees to coach their peers? Well, okay, that's a tough question because that one actually goes a lot into um, the system and also some people say it's the funding. But I, I must go into two parts of it because uh, what we have engaged so far with the companies uh, and our experience tell us the part where to encourage people to coach has two dimensions. We encourage them by giving them time. We encourage them by giving them the right setup, right environment, so time and space or environment is important. To really recognize them is the next step where, you see, there is really the performance of the team as a whole that is doing better. And there's always a job role 
that is doing or having a better outcome. So the coach themselves, to recognize them, we need to really talk about giving them the space, the time, and the recognition through numerations or through uh, awards or some kind of ways to recognize them in a platform. I think the time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Poa and the participants in this session. Please help us with a short survey before you leave for a break and come back for the next session.